Hi, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about how we can break out of our brains and enable something that many of us take for granted. So what I'm showing you here is a picture of what we call the perception action loop. Your brain perceives constantly the environment and then generates appropriate movements. So that's the output of the brain. And then the input is the perception again. And that's the loop that's constantly cycling, constantly spinning. And we don't notice the power of this loop till it is interrupted, for example, through a spinal cord injury, because you had an accident here that disrupts the flow of information in the loop. So these days we have technologies, and here you see uh, a handheld video we made at the Cybathlon, where athletes who have severe spinal cord injury or amputees competed with each other using bionic technology. And this was revolutionary, actually, because for the first time, very different technologies were pitted against each other. And here you see the leg of the skeleton race. So these are all gentlemen, in this case only gentlemen, unfortunately, who are fully paralyzed uh, in their legs. And they wear basically robotic pants that allow them to walk. And some of the things that you see here look actually really incredible because these are fully wheelchair-bound people. But one thing that I want you to pay attention to is how often they're trying to basically get their robot to do what they want, like walking up this ramp. And this is actually really the challenge I want to talk to you about today. The fact that robotic technology has tremendously progressed. But for us to be able to interact with the robotic technology so it feels seamless, that's actually a real challenge. And so what we're really talking about here is that all these gentlemen, if you talk to them privately, as I did, will tell you they much prefer using their wheelchairs because it feels much more comfortable and natural than actually walking with these fancy machines. So this is a problem we need to think about if we want to think about the progress of robotics. And one way of thinking about that is simply to look at how we're dealing with amputees, for example. So this is Jamie Oliver's hand, highly dexterous, as you may imagine. In the middle, you see a current <laughs> prosthetic hand as it's prescribed by the NHS, and effectively, it's a glorified claw. And at the top right, you see here one of the best robotic hands on the market manufactured here in London. And the problem is not that we cannot make robotic hands that have all the dexterity of Jamie Oliver's hands. We don't know how to enable the brain to control these. And the standard answer from a neuroscientist like I am or I was is simply to record from neurons in your brain. And the, from the more neurons you record, the better it is. And fortunately, we have seen a rapid increase. So from 19... 50s onwards, we've seen a rapid increase in the number of neurons we can record from. This is a logarithmic scale, so this is 10 neurons, 100 neurons, 1,000 neurons. And up here, you see actually some of the videos that Jeremy just showed you a few minutes earlier. It's a fantastic progress. And so just like it's in computer chips, we're speaking now for more slow in neuroscience. Every seven years, we double up the number of neurons we can record from. So if we just increase more, we should be able to do better. But here's a bit of a snitch. If you want to basically try to work out how many neurons you need to record from to really capture all of behavior, probably you should record from all the neurons in your brain. And even at this fantastic exponential growth, you'll have to wait till 2010 to be able to do that. So the question is, can we find a shortcut to neuroscience and neural engineering that is not related to neurons? So how can we get to the video that you see on the left that was our team computing entry? Uh, based on a very basic question, and that's namely, how do we actually move? And what you see here is a graduate student of mine wearing a glove technology that we developed that allows us to measure every single movement of the hand. And with that, um, I asked a very simple question. What are the two most important hand movements that we make? In every textbook in neurology, every textbook in hand surgery, every textbook on rehabilitation will tell you it's the precision pincer grip and the power grasp, and they're truly important. And then you ask, who actually says that it is so? And you find out it was some country doctor in 17th century Britain who said, these are the two most important hand <laughs> movements. So while we're in a day and age where we can talk about your personal genetic sequence, the 3D structure of your proteins, the large-scale brain connectivity that we get from the human brain mapping, we actually know very, very little about human hand movements or human movements in general. And so basically, when I set up my lab seven years ago at Imperial, I convinced my dean that I would go on a, on a crazy project that was unfundable and, and also not recommended for me to do. And that was simply the fact I simply want to record everything in the perception action loop as far as we can go. And I'm just going to show you a snapshot of that. 
So we spent roughly five years developing technology, allowing us to capture the movement of every single finger, the movement of every single of our major joints in the body, all our eye movements, everything that we see, everything that we hear. And so we're roughly capturing 80% of everything that flows into our brain and roughly 85% that flows out of our brain. So we're really capturing this perception action loop. And so the next video shows basically view from the brain's cockpit. So you see, we converted part of the lab into a studio flat and made people live in there for a whole day. Here you see our subject. And on the right, you can see here what his hands are doing in this very instant. On the top, you see what he is seeing. And that little colorful dot shows you where exactly he's looking. On the top left, you see how his body is configured in space. And this colorful vector jutting out of this head is where exactly in space he's focusing his attention. And there's also audio, but I'm going to spare you for that. So we call this the human ethome project. And the ethome is just like the genome, the set of all your perception action data that we can collect. And it's a huge database. We have 60 people sequenced ethologically now. We have roughly 45 terabytes of data. And now we can basically throw a lot of machine learning algorithms on that. And I'm going to spare you all of that. But we can basically go back to the original question is, what are the most important hand movements? So if we simply let an algorithm that knows nothing about the history of psychology or surgery or neuroscience look at it, this is what you get out of that. And the answer is very, very different from precision pincer grip and power grasp. And so with these three hand movements alone, if you combine them, you can roughly explain 80% of all that your hands do during a day. And that then rests us, okay, if this is really good data analysis, because I can just stop here and just show you the fancy video, I can thus basically continue and start building a robotic technology that allows a paralyzed person with simple arm muscle signals to control a complex dexterous robotic hand we developed in the lab. And all of a sudden you see we can do things that were thought unthinkable in robotics and impossible in prosthetics. So here you see the user texting on a mobile phone with a single hand, and on the bottom right you just saw the video of him dexterously operating a tool. So we have full finger control and full ability to, to manipulate these movements. And typically at the moment, the assumption is, oh, you have to record from, all, from many neurons in the brain and you have to be able to write into the neurons so the brain can sense what you're touching. And this just demonstrates you don't need to do that at all. Let me show you another snapshot from this huge data set that we collected. So you may have noticed that to see, you have to look. And looking meaning means moving your eyes in space. And the interesting thing about eye movements is that they're retained from many, many disorders that affect your ability to move your limbs. Parkinson's, MS, muscular dystrophy, spinal cord injury, stroke, amputees, and just very old and frail bodies, all these people retain the ability to move their eyes in a targeted fashion. And so if you look at this beautiful painting here by a Russian master, your eye movement pattern will roughly look like that. If I now ask you the question, for example, how wealthy is the family? then your eye movement pattern looks like this. If I ask you what clothes the other wearing, then you're looking at it like that. And that's well known for 60 years in psychology. And all that we're doing is, because we have a large database and some smart algorithms, we want to go the other way. I know how you're looking at the scene, and I want to know what are you thinking about the scene. At least for, for actions on physical movements, that's I want to show you is demonstrable. So the first thing we need to be able to do is develop technology that allows us to capture from a large amount of people very cheaply eye movements in 3D. And so we did this in 2009. And in 2011, we had this demonstration with a paralyzed patient who basically could control in real time without any brain surgery or similar things within five minutes of putting on this device an arcade video game. And then we took this further. And in this case, we correlated how Eye movements that you made while you walk around and plan your strategy of how to walk through a room can be decoded by the system, and we can translate that into driving commands for a wheelchair. So just to be clear, this is not a user interface that you have to learn. You're just asked to imagine what you would be doing normally with your body, and the system decodes that. And so we can take that even further. So this is fresh out of the lab with children with muscular dystrophy. So their muscles are basically slowly killed. We can basically enable them to move their body again by simply using uh, decoding of their eye gaze location and where they're looking 
Uh, so this girl here can now, for example, move her hand to that through a robotic interface that all that it requires is in a bit of a ghastly looking but very simple eye tracking user interface. So this way we can establish and re-establish the ability to move again. So we can not only apply this technology to uh, people with disorders uh, of movement, we can also apply this to, uh, to what we could call consumer technology. So in this case, we we tried to revert a challenge that was made, namely the ability of our body to control more limbs than we actually have. So let me just show you this video here. So this is the same technology running, operating again. And here we are asking uh, this graduate student of mine to imagine she would be painting with an oil brush, this oil painting. And the system streaming decodes that and translates that into robotic movements. And what I hope the left video on the left show you can show you, because you can't see that on the video on the right, is that while she's doing that, she's eating and drinking at the same time. So this is a fundamental question from cognitive neuroscience, because our brain has specific areas for specific limbs. Can we actually control extra limbs at the same time as we're using our normal limbs? So the answer for that is, experimentally speaking, yes. And then we took this a step further. So what happens if I have limbs or parts of limbs that are not normally part of your hand. So if I simply have my hand and I have a thumb and I give you an extra thumb. Okay, so this is the next video I want to show you. So this is what we call supernumerary robotics. So we built a robotic interface and we basically, uh, it's a ghastly looking interface, it's not a product, it's, it's, it's R&D, but basically this person has a second thumb or a third thumb and basically can now start to play music. And again here the challenge is, can you learn skilled musical behavior if you've learned it on five fingers and translate that into six finger or 11 finger piano play? And again, it was unclear whether that's possible. And after roughly one hour, and I can try to, I, I will not try to give you the video, but he can play correct music. And he can play a piece and use all six fingers. So that's a very experimental demonstration that actually our brain's capacity for learning adaptation can be really harnessed to push and augment the human body, not just to restore it for those who have lost abilities to move, but also to go beyond. And I think this is very important these days because very often robotics is seen as something that replaces humans. But here I want to see robotics and show you robotics in a context of where we're augmenting humans, giving us new abilities. And of course, uh, this is a talk from the trenches of science and technology, so I should show you who is standing with me in the trenches. And it's a fantastic team of engineers, biologists, physicists, and computer scientists, and two medical doctors. And these are the people who have chosen to invest in us. Thank you.